In chapter one uh, of biology, we're going to look at uh, the scientific method. And you'll recall in any science class that you've ever taken, uh, this is usually one of the first topics that we discuss. And so chapter one kind of gives an overview uh, of the process of science. So to start out with, let's just discuss science in general. You know, if we're saying this is a science class, what really is science? Well, by definition, the book says that science is it's a body of knowledge. And specifically, this body of knowledge is about the natural world. World. Uh, now we know that when we say a body of knowledge, I mean this is a very, very broad category. You know, within the the big category of science, you have all different fields of study. You know, specifically for us this semester, we're going to be dealing with uh, the field of biology, which says um, the body of knowledge that we're focusing on uh, is studying living organisms. So you know, this semester we're going to look at at animals and plants and fungus. We're even going to talk about protists and bacteria, um, all of which fall under the category of living things. But as far as science is concerned, biology is not the only field. Um, those of you that are going to go into the medical field, you may uh, take anatomy courses or microbiology courses. Some of you may take chemistry or physics. Uh, so just be mindful that when we talk about this, 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 uh, this field of, of science, it's, it's a very, very broad general knowledge. But again, the key here is uh, it's about the natural world. And the purpose of science, the purpose of this, this course, is to discover something new, to discover something that, that you don't already know about. And hopefully, uh, that's what we're going to help you to do this semester. Now, how do you go about learning about the natural world? Well, in science, we use the scientific method. Um, by definition, scientific method, uh, it's basically a series of steps that allows us to either solve problems or to answer questions. And the whole goal here is that it does so efficiently and it does so effectively. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, as far as the scientific method is concerned, this is something that we use every day. Uh, it's basically problem solving. You know, we problem solve uh, all day long. You know, you get to a stop sign and you have the, the decision to make of, of should you stay or should you go uh, through the stop sign and you know of course we look both ways and you make a determination so problem solving uh, or scientific method again it's not something just for biology class this is something that we use uh, in our everyday life but one of the objectives says that you need to be able to list uh, the steps of the scientific method and so uh, very quickly they are step number one making observations step number two forming a hypothesis uh, step number three is actually doing an experiment. And step number four, forming a conclusion. So what we're going to look at through this chapter is to break those four steps down a little bit more uh, and look at some specific details about them. So starting with the first one, uh, the first part of a, the scientific method is, is to form or to make observations. So first off, what is an observation? Well, uh, observation is a statement about something you've noticed. Now, be mindful. Um, the things that we observe uh, aren't just things that we see. You know, I think about um, as I'm standing in front of the classroom, you know, one of the main observations that I make is through vision, I observe my students. Um, and, and I learn things about my students from just watching them. But keep in mind, when we make observations, it's not just things we see, it's also things we smell things we taste, things we touch, things we hear. Uh, basically, observations is a time where you just gather information using any of your five senses. Now, once you've made observations uh, and you've come up upon something that uh, potentially you have a question about, uh, the second thing you do is you formulate your hypothesis. Now, we've been taught our whole entire life that a hypothesis is basically just an educated guess. Which it really, you know, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of it, that is what it is. Uh, but the definition your book uses is that a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for what you've observed. In other words, it's your best guess or your best explanation as to why something has occurred. Now, there are two key characteristics of a scientific hypothesis. First off, a hypothesis has to be testable. Meaning, there has to be a way to test my hypothesis and determine if it could be considered accurate or not. So there has to be a possible way to evaluate it. But the key part of this testability is that it has to be something that you can physically measure in the universe. So it has to be something that you could weigh or something that you could count. 
you can't say that fairy fairies, garden fairies, are the reason why, because those would be considered supernatural things that aren't governed by the laws of nature. Therefore, we cannot test it scientifically. So, a hypothesis has to be testable through the measurable universe. The second characteristic of a hypothesis is that it is falsifiable, meaning when I make my proposed explanation, there has to be the possibility uh, that I could be wrong. Now, of course, no one wants to be wrong, uh, but there has to be that uh, ability or the potential that I could be right, but I also uh, could be wrong. Now, I wanted to take kind of a side note here uh, and mention that a hypothesis and a theory are not the same thing. A lot of people have that misconception. And we also have to be careful when we use that word theory because there's actually a couple definitions of the word theory. Now, just in everyday use, the word theory is used as kind of an untested idea. Like someone might say, well, see, I have this theory that such and such. Now, a scientific theory is not an untested idea. By definition, a scientific theory is actually a broad explanation for an observation. So it's an explanation for something that you have witnessed based on, here's the key, well-supported hypotheses. So a scientific theory is actually something that has been tested and it has been supported. So when we, we talk about things like the germ theory or the theory of evolution or the cell theory, these are not just untested ideas. These are things that have been tested and they have been supported. So I did just want to make that generalization just in knowing that a theory and a hypothesis is not the same thing, but making sure that you understand what a scientific theory uh, truly is. So kind of putting what we've talked about so far together. So we said the first part in the scientific method is the observation. So let's just say in general that I observe fruits and vegetables contain vitamin C. Now how do I know that? Because I can read uh, the food label on fruits and vegetables and I can see that they contain a certain amount of vitamin C. And let's say that I also make an observation that people with diets rich in fruits and vegetables are generally healthier because I have seen, I know people that eat lots of fruits and vegetables and they're very rarely having to go to the doctor. So based on those two observations, I might formulate the hypothesis that simply says consuming vitamin C decreases the risk of catching a cold. Now, a couple things to mindful of. First off, this is a sensible hypothesis. This is a sensible proposed explanation of if you consume vitamin C, if you eat and drink vitamin C, you'll be healthier. Does it fall under the, the characteristics of a hypothesis? Is it testable? Is it falsifiable? I would say yes. Yes, you could test this. You could test the amount of vitamin C people have and, and range if they get colds or not. And there is the potential that I could be wrong. Now, a couple of things that we want to mention in this section uh, that you probably heard of before, but when we use the scientific method, we use two types of reasoning, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. And a lot of people have trouble with these two terms. So I really wanted to take a moment and make sure that we were able to distinguish between these two. So starting with deductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning, the key here is to go from general, meaning broad, to specific. So what happens in deductive reasoning is you begin with a very general statement or a very general hypothesis and over time this leads to a very specific logical conclusion. For example, all men are mortal. Well that's a very broad general statement because it's talking about all men. But what deductive reasoning says is okay if I know that all men are mortal and I know that Harold is a man then I can form the specific conclusion that Harold is mortal. So I started with this general statement about all men, but in the end I made a very specific logical conclusion about one specific person, which is Harold. That's deductive reasoning. Another example, if all birds have wings, so again this is a very general statement because we're talking about all birds, if all birds have wings, and I know that a robin is a bird, then the robin has wings. Again, starting with a general statement but forming a specific conclusion. Uh, finally, third example. To get a bachelor's degree from Utah State University, a student must have 120 credits. Now, again, that's a very general statement because it's talking about all the students. And any student at, at that university has to have 120 credits to get a bachelor's degree. Well, Sally, specifically, has more than 130 credits. Therefore, Sally specifically has a bachelor's degree. So again, the key with deductive reasoning is we're starting with a general statement 
and then that eventually leads to a very specific conclusion. Now, inductive reasoning, on the other hand, uh, is the opposite. So with inductive reasoning, we're going to start out with a specific statement, and we're going to use it to form some generalizations. So for example, take Harold. So we start specifically with Harold, and we say Harold is a grandfather. We also know that Harold is bald, so those are some specific things. But therefore, since Harold is a grandfather and Harold is bald, all grandfathers are bald. So we took a specific statement and we used it form to form a generalized conclusion. Now, is that necessarily true? Are all grandfathers bald? Well, not necessarily, but again, that's not the purpose of inductive reasoning, for it not necessarily to be accurate, but to go from specific to general. Another example, this cat is black, that's a specific statement. That cat is black, a third cat is black, therefore all cats are black. So going from specific to, to general. So keep in mind that scientists are going to use inductive reasoning, again remember inductive going from specific to general, to help formulate hypotheses, to help formulate theories. And then deductive reasoning, which again is going from general to specific, then allows them to apply these to specific situations. So just be mindful of the opposite here, but also note that both of these forms of reasoning can be used in science. Uh, last thing that we did want to mention uh, in this section is keep in mind that when we talk about a hypothesis, in just a moment in the next section, we're going to look at testing these hypotheses, but just be mindful that at the end of an experiment, if you determine that, that what you predicted actually turned to be true, it supports your hypothesis, but does not necessarily prove it. And the reason being, because there might be alternative reasons why your hypothesis was supported. For example, there's been a lot of study in schizophrenia. You know, you've all heard of schizophrenia before. Um, and so in a particular study that I was reading about, they learned that in this particular family, uh, the father, uh, the grandfather had schizophrenia, uh, the son had schizophrenia, and then he went on to have a child. And they were looking to see, you know, is schizophrenia something that could be inherited? And in their family pattern, it looked that schizophrenia was something that was inherited. One of the things that they also had to consider, an alternate reason why the child and maybe children from here on out could have schizophrenia may not just be because of what they're inheriting, but it also could be influenced by the behavior of the parent. You know, if the parent has schizophrenia and they behave in that manner, it might influence the child to take on those same behavior patterns even if it wasn't something that was inherited. So they had to kind of realize that there could be alternate reasons why your hypothesis is supported. So we use the term not proven, but supported. And then of course if your prediction, your hypothesis is deemed false, you would just simply say it was rejected um, or disproven.